Welcome to the Organic Chemistry Podcast, Dr. Brian Lloyd's Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures and Solutions to Homework Problems. In this Scribblecast lecture, we're continuing our examination of the reactions of aldehydes and ketones. Having covered in the last Scribblecast lecture, finishing off reduction reactions, we're going to take a look at oxidation reactions of aldehydes and ketones. Now this is rather a short section, so because of this, we're going to actually continue and take a look at a unique reaction, which is the sodium bisulfite reaction of aldehydes and ketones. And then we're going to shift gears a little bit and take a look at the reactivity off the carbonyl. That is reactivity caused by the carbonyl group and other parts of the molecule. So this little scribble cast will be covering several short topics and then introducing one larger one. So let's begin by looking at the oxidation of aldehydes. Now aldehyde oxidation chemistry is interesting only in the fact that aldehydes typically are more easily oxidized than alcohols. Now because of this we can use all the standard oxidizing agents. So if I take a standard aldehyde like ethanol and I hit it with oxidizing agent which I'm going to symbolize with an O in square brackets oxidizing agent aldehyde will go to carboxylic acid now in order to do this I can use all of the standard oxidizing agents that is O can equal CrO3 in acid or I could use Cr2O7 2 minus in acid I can even use chromic acid H2CrO4 or if you like KMNO4, hot KMNO4 in acid. These are all powerful oxidizing agents and if reacted with the primary alcohol like ethanol, these reagents go right through to the carboxylic acid as well. But as stated, the aldehyde group is more easily oxidized than an alcohol. So there are some special reagents that can be used. Okay. And I'm going to have to give this a new symbol, but I'm going to give it oxidizing agent sub W. These are weaker oxidizing agents. And they are the following silver ammonia silver that has two ammonias attached to it in hydroxide we have copper citrate 2 minus Two citrates, two minus, and that's got hydroxide, and we've got copper tartrate. <laughs> Tartrate. twice 2 minus in hydroxide. Now silver, I'm going to call these 1, 2, 3. 1 is often called Tollens reagent.
two, the citrate is called Benedict's reagent. And three is called feelings reagent. Now these are mild oxidizing agents. And because of that, they are effective with aldehydes, but they won't oxidize things like alcohols. The other point to note is that they're all in base. So indeed, you form the carboxylic acid, but because of reaction with base, the proton, the acid deprotonates, and you end up producing the anionic form. So aldehydes are more easily oxidized than alcohols and will be oxidized by even these mild oxidizing agents, Tollens reagent, Benedict's reagent, and Feeling's reagent. Now Tollens reagent, for example, is a special reagent because it can be used to test for aldehydes because if you oxidize the aldehyde, you reduce the silver and you get silver solid. This will often form a silver mirror on a test tube, allowing you to have an excellent test for aldehydes, indicated by the silver coating on the inner wall of the test tube. It actually looks like a shiny silver mirror when it's done correctly. Benedict's reagent and Feeling's reagent generate uh, cuprous oxide, which is a brown precipitate. It can also be used as a test to test for aldehydes. Ketones don't readily oxidize. A ketone is pretty much as oxidized as it's going to get without breaking carbon-carbon bonds. So any attempt to use these oxidizing agents on standard ketones leads to no reaction unless really harsh conditions are employed and you start breaking up the molecule. Now, that's, that's it for oxidation. What we want to do next is look at a special reaction called the sodium bisulfite reaction. sodium bisulfite. Now, there are certain scenarios where it would be advantageous to be able to separate out aldehyde. And you can think of two scenarios. One, where aldehyde's an impurity. Suppose you have alkene or some other organic. And in this organic, you have it pretty much 90-95% pure, but there are trace amounts of some kind of aldehyde contaminating the sample. It would be advantageous to be able to remove that aldehyde. Secondly, sometimes you want to have aldehyde as your major product, and there may be other trace organics contaminating the aldehyde. So if aldehyde is in the purity, aldehyde impurity removal or you may have a scenario where you have aldehyde product purification. This sodium bisulfite reaction can help in both of these two scenarios and let's take a look at what is involved. In this reaction, we have a standard aldehyde or methyl ketone. And we'll look at the product yields, but I'm going to draw an aldehyde. And we react this with sodium bisulfite. 
sodium plus, and the bisulfite is sulfur, the double bond oxygen, double bond oxygen. We have an O with a lone pairs, H, and a lone pair here. And if I do this, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven electrons of sulfur, seven minus six has formal charge of negative. And so this sulfur is nucleophilic and can attack carbon, moving the pi electrons out. If it does so, I will form this intermediate. There we go. In fact, let's switch the O and the H because it'll better show what I want to show this way. Now, the O minus that forms is very basic. The SO3H group is quite acidic, as, and you'll see why in a moment. And essentially, it makes sense that there's an intramolecular loss of a proton. Now, maybe this H will transfer, and maybe this H will be loose to solvent, and the O minus will pull an H off of solvent. But essentially, essentially, very quickly, we'll get right down to the oxygen off the carbon becoming an OH group. And then we have an SO3 minus group. Further, the reason this SO3 minus group or SO3H group is so acidic is that the resultant anion can delocalize the charge. There's resonance structures. I can dump electrons in and move that charge out to all the oxygens. So now the O minus is here. We can do it again. And this reaction can go backwards. It's reversible. We can remove the SO3 in acid or base. Okay, now let's take a look at the resultant bisulfate. Now, to what extent does this reaction work? Well, for aldehydes, our yields are pretty good. They're somewhere between 70 to 90 percent. Ketones are more difficult though. The best you can do is methyl ketones. And the yields are not great. With methyl ketones you get somewhere between 12 and 56 percent. You can do it, but it's not great. 
Other ketones don't react, and this has to do with steric effects. As it gets bulkier, it's harder for to get the bisulfite to act nucleophilically. Now, let's consider what happens when you do this and how you would do it. Let's consider step one, aldehyde impurity removal. You see, I wouldn't, I have mainly some alkene, some organic, with a little bit of aldehyde. What can I do? Well, I can dis place the organic in a separatory funnel. Let's assume it's less dense, so the organic's on top. So this is my organic up here. And in the separatory funnel, the lower layer is water, but I use water with bisulfite. I actually dissolve the sodium HSO3. Okay, so this is sodium HSO3 in an aqueous layer. And I shake it. As I shake it, the alkene's not going to do anything. The other organics aren't. But any methyl ketones or any aldehydes will react. And when they react, they become this. And it has this anionic head, which makes it very more polar, much more water-soluble. Add the OH group and the SO3 minus, it migrates into the water layer. So if in this organic layer there's any trace aldehyde or ketone and you shake it really well, that aldehyde or ketone, methyl ketone, will migrate into the water layer. And hence the aldehyde impurity is removed. In step two, however, we could take the aldehyde, right, convert it to this material, extract it into a water layer, leaving organic impurities behind. We could crystallize out, recrystallize the material from the water, isolate the salt, then redissolve it and convert it in acid or base back to the aldehyde. Still it off and we'd have ultra pure aldehyde. So we could use it as a product purification method as well. So the sodium bisulfite reaction is a nice methodology for removing aldehyde impurities or purifying aldehyde product. It is nicely reversible and allows us to take what might be, and you know, uh, aldehydes with, with short chains are water soluble, but with what might be a water insoluble aldehyde, a long carbon chain, take what is a water insoluble material, make it water soluble, work it up, and then convert it back. Okay. Well, so far, everything we've looked at in terms of the reactions of aldehydes and ketones has focused on the carbonyl group. All of our reactivity has been focused on the carbon of the carbonyl caused by the delta minus and delta plus. But the carbonyl group affects the chemistry of the neighboring carbons. There's more to the chemistry of aldehydes and ketones than just attacking the carbonyl. You see, oxygen's electronegative. It places a delta plus on the carbon. Because of that, that carbon withdraws electrons from neighboring carbons, putting small delta pluses on those carbons. These carbons, if I isolate this as my carbonyl group, that's my carbonyl group, these carbons are referred to as alpha carbons. The alpha carbons have hydrogens, and those hydrogens are designated alpha hydrogens. Because of the electronegativity of the carbonyl group, a negative charge on those alpha carbons is a little more stabilized than normally. Because of this, formation of the negative charge is a little more favored, hence loss of H plus is favored. So alpha hydrogens are a little more acidic. This can be attributed due to a delta plus. on the 
alpha carbon. That alpha carbon delta plus is caused by the electronegative carbonyl withdrawing electrons, and it will help to stabilize an anion. And two, there is resonance stabilization as well. That is, if we lose, if we have some kind of alpha hydrogen loss, such as in this carbonyl. So I'm going to hit it with some powerful base and cause alpha hydrogen loss. I'll get a carb anion. As I stated, the delta plus on the carb anion on this carbon helps stabilize that negative charge, makes that carbon a little more electronegative than normal. But it's not just this inductive effect or electronegativity. There is also resonance. Now this molecule, this resonance structure, looks very similar to molecules we've seen before that look like this. This was called an enol. If you deprotonate an alcohol, you get an alkaoxide. If you deprotonate enol, it's referred to as an enolate. The carbanion is resonance stabilized with a structure referred to as an enolate. The kind of base you need to do this are powerful bases. You must use things like sodium hydroxide as potentially the weakest base, uh, sodium alkoxide, where you have carbons off the oxygen, or very powerful sodium amide, NH2 minus, or you might even use butyl lithium. where carbon minus pulls the proton off. Very powerful base. These bases can deprotonate the alpha hydrogen because it's a little more acidic than a normal alkane. In fact, alkanes which have pKa's around 40 something, around 45, this pKa has been dropped and in acidity increased down to a value of about 19 to 21. So it's a fairly large increase in acidity. Although, with a pKa of 19 to 21, you're still not considered an acid, so to speak. Remember, carboxylic acids have pKa's down to around 4. Now we can take this to further extreme by adding more carbonyls. Consider the following molecule. What if you have a beta diketone? That is, you have a carbonyl, a carbon with a couple hydrogens, then another carbon, carbonyl. Uh, this carbonyl has alpha carbons here and here, so the other carbonyl is at the beta carbon, so it's called a beta diketone. Now, suppose I have a beta diketone like this. Well, now, if I deprotonate with a powerful base, actually, let's draw it centered. Well, yeah, let's just draw it about here. If I deprotonate this guy, and get the carb anion, I can draw more resonance structures. I can move the pi electrons this way and get this enolate. Okay. 
or I could have moved the lone pair from here, this direction, out to the other oxygen. That's fine. And so there are more enolate resonance contributors. We have two of them. And the greater number of enolate, the greater delocalization, the spreading out of the negative charge increases the acidity and makes it more likely you can use a proton. Now, the pKa was 19 to 21 when you had one carbonyl. The pKa now has dropped for this hydrogen down to about 9. Still not the strength of a carboxylic acid, but certainly getting stronger. Now, the whole relationship between the carbonyl and the enol is based on the acidity of this alpha hydrogen. For example, if I take a simple molecule like acetone, I could imagine an equilibrium with the loss of a proton, where a proton is lost and you get a carbanion. I can resonance stabilize that carbanion with the enolate. And I can imagine the enolate picking up a proton and forming the enol. In other words, there is an equilibrium between the enol and the ketone or the enol in keto forms. Now the relationship between an enol and keto is that they, there is resonance relationship, there is movement of pi electrons, but it's more than that. There is the shifting of a proton. A proton is removed and a proton is added to different atoms. When you shift protons, one or more protons, and move pi electrons, you don't have resonance you have created a pair of totemers. Totemers. The relationship between the enol and the ketoform is totomeric. The process is called totomerization, and the two are called enols. I'm sorry, the two are called uh, totemers. Now, one of the questions that one has to ask is which form predominates in solution and why? If we look at the ratio of concentration of enol to keto form, that is, we put the concentration of enol here, we actually measure it, and the, divided by the concentration of the keto form. If we solve this, we find out the enol is only present in a tiny amount, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. In other words, if I solve this, I get the keto form, concentration of the keto form, equals approximately 4.0 times 10 to the fifth 
the concentration of the enol form. Or in other words, for every enol molecule, there will be 400,000 keto molecules. That means the enol form is present in only very, very trace amounts. Okay. Well, that being the case, why? Why would there be this difference? Well, I can draw the pi system of the keto form and compare it to the pi system of the eno form. Now, oxygen is very electronegative. That puts a delta minus here, and that puts a delta plus on the carbon. So the pi system of the carbonyl bond has a side-to-side -side overlap of a pi bond, but more than that, there's this powerful dipole that is strengthening bond by attraction, inductive electron attraction of, of the delta plus and the delta minus towards each other. And then, then you have the enol. Now the enol is attached to the pi system. You have the OH attached to the pi system, and you have a CH2. Oxygen's electronegative, but the delta minus is no longer part of the pi system. You get a big delta plus on one carbon, and it's electron withdrawing, which produces a smaller delta plus on the other carbon. Your pi system has lost the opposite charge charges that led to an increased force of attraction through the pi system. As a result, the pi system in the carbon-carbon double bond is not enhanced. So because the carbonyl bond is stronger and more stable, typically, typically the carbonyl form predominates. Now there are exceptions to this, and there are rare cases where the enol form does predominate. And what are those cases? Well, let's quickly take a look at several of them. The first case you're very familiar with, and that is the case of cyclohexa 24 diene one ohm Cyclohexa. 2,4-diene, 1 ohm. Let's try drawing that. Okay, so it's a cyclohexane ring. And there's a ketone. And then I have 1, 2. We have a double bond at 2, 3, 4, and double bond at 4. Okay, so it looks like there's two H's here. So we have this molecule. This is the keto form, obviously. Let's see if we can draw the enol. Now, in the enol form, what happens is the H gets pulled off, making a carbon minus. I shift create pi electrons here and put the H on the oxygen. So it's going to look like this. So we're going to get a pi bond here and an OH, and this is an enol. Notice cyclohexa 24 diene one ohms totemer, the enol, is a molecule we're very familiar with called phenol. Now, phenol, I've heard of. I haven't heard of cyclohexa 24 diene one ohm. In fact, Phenol predominates and is formed in 100%. The molecule cyclohexa 24 diene 1 ohm does not exist. The equilibrium shifted completely to the right. Why? Hmm. What could cause this? Well, the answer is staring you right in the face here. It's the aromatic ring, aromaticity. Aromaticity is very stabilizing, and 
Producing an aromatic ring gives you a lot of energy because of the delocalization of the pi electrons in the cyclic structure. Going to cyclohexa 2,4-diene 1 ohm, you disrupt that aromaticity, and that takes energy. The carbonyl strengthening of the bond is not enough to overcome aromaticity, and hence phenol exists. Now, you are responsible for the name of this totemer, cyclohexa 2,4-diene 1 ohm. But this type of relationship goes beyond being able just simply to explain it. I'll give you an example. See, in a reactions question on a test, you could be given this molecule, which does exist. And you could be asked, what is the product of this reaction? Well, this is aldehydes and ketones. Oxidizing agent with a secondary alcohol will produce a ketone. And most students will just draw this. And they will walk away from the question, leave the question, move on, and I've got my product. And they'll lose half the marks because in truth, yes, this molecule forms, but it instantly tautomerizes to phenol. So notice, you have to ha know this so well that it's stuck in your mind that whenever you see this molecule, you'll get it tautomerizing to phenol. Alright? So be aware of that. What are some other molecules in which the enol form predominates? Well, one is in the case of pentan 24 dione Let's try drawing that molecule. In the case of pentan 24 dione I get this. All right. Now we've got two ketoforms, uh, two ketones in this molecule, and clearly I can form an enol to either one. Now it'll be symmetrical. It's symmetrical in this case, so putting the OH on this side or OH on that side will generate the same thing. But I can draw an equilibrium. I'll put it on this side. Okay, and I'll get a double bond. There we go. And there's an enol. Now, if I'd done it on the other side, it would just get this molecule flipped over. Now, let's name this molecule. It's clearly one, two, three, four, five. Uh, highest priority groups of carbonyl, so I have a pentane, a pentanone, and there's an ene, a pentenone. So here's a one, two, three. This is a pent three ene, two ohne. And I have a uh, hydroxy, a carbon four, so it looks like a four hydroxy. So the enol. It's called 4-hydroxy, pent-3-ene, 2-ohm, whereas the keto form is pentan 24 dione What is the relative percentage composition? Well, the keto form is only found in 20% in solution. It's 80% the hydroxy form. And now the obvious question is why? Well, one of the big reasons, of course, is this. What is that? That's hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. I 
don't have room to write it. I'll just say H bonding. H bonding, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is an attractive force. It's an intermolecular force that can raise boiling points, but it can occur intramolecularly. And when it does, it can be a very potent force of attraction. So certainly this is going to contribute to it. So uh, we have two, I'm going to call it point two to keep in line with your notes, hydrogen bonding. An intramolecular force of attraction in this case. Intramolecular hydrogen bonding. The second thing you'll notice is that the double bonds between the C double bond O and the C double bond C are now conjugated. Conjugated double bonds allow the P orbitals to have side to side overlap and delocalize electrons. This delocalization of electrons is stabilizing. Compare this to the original pentane. 4 diode, the double, we have double bond, single bond, single bond. It's not alternating, so it's not conjugated. So because you lack conjugated double bonds, it's not there. Pentane 2,4 diode lacks the hydrogen bonding, lacks the conjugated double bonds, and because of that, these energetically stabilize and favor the enol in this case. Not to the point that it's 100%, but certainly to the point where it is the major product. <clears throat> now the last example we're going to look at, in which the enol form predominates, is the case for cyclohexan and you are responsible for these names. One, two, Dione. Now, if I draw this molecule, cyclohexane, a cyclohexane ring, I can do that. And I can draw a ketone, and I can draw a ketone. There. There's cyclohexane 1, 2, dione. If I were to draw the enol form, I would have to pull an H off of this position, and I, if I do it off the bottom as well, it would form the same thing, just flipped. Pull an H off, make a pi bond here, and create an OH. So I'm going to do that. i got a pi bond. I get an OH, and I still have this double bond O. Okay, well, let's think about it. What is the percentage composition? Well, in this case, it's 100% this molecule. Well, let's name the molecule. I have a cyclohexane. Uh, I have a cyclohexene with an own. The own's highest priority gets one. So I have a cyclohex 2-ene. And I'm going to just say own. I could say one own. Okay, uh, let's put the one in. If you're in doubt, put the one in. But you could just say cyclohexenone. And then one, two, a two hydroxy. So I have two hydroxy, and again, you're responsible for this nomenclature. Two hydroxy, cyclohex, two e, one ohm. And you get 100% of the enol in this case. Well, certainly we can see uh, point two again. H bonding between the lone pair, that's intramolecular hydrogen bonding. And that's something that you don't have in the other case. So we'll call that point two again. Intramolecular hydrogen bonding.
And one other thing, uh, what about conjugated double bonds? Well, yes, you've got them, but you also have the carbonyls are conjugated, so there's no net gain. Both systems have conjugated double bonds, so in this case, that's not real an issue, really an issue. But one of the things that is an issue is electronegativity. Here, we have a force of attraction between this OH group and the carbonyl. But what around the, about the original? Well, electronegativity puts a delta minus on this carbonyl. Electronegativity puts a delta minus on the oxygen of this carbonyl. And notice what you've got. You've got two delta minuses in close proximity. There's a repulsive force in the original keto form, right, that is changed to an attractive force in the enol form. We're essentially getting rid of a dipole-dipole repulsion. And so, the absence of the dipole dipole repulsion favors it. So what favors the enol? The enol is favored by the absence of the dipole-dipole repulsions found in the keto form and the creation of intramolecular hydrogen bonding which is attractive. You need to know and be able to explain all three of these as well as to watch for them when they form in reactions. If we ever form a cyclohexane 1,2-dione in a reaction, you have to convert it, convert it to, convert it to the 2-hydroxycyclohex-2-ene-1-ohm. All right. The last thing I wish to point out is the importance of this type of totomerization, the increased acidity of the alpha hydrogens to biochemistry and that occurs in the de Bruyne which we have already covered the Bruyne van Eckenstein transformation gotta love that name de Bruyne van Eckenstein I just think that's so cool love saying it de Bruyne van Eckenstein Okay, and this is a transformation in which fructose, the explanation by which fructose is described as a reducing sugar. Fructose has, defructose has this structure. And you notice it has a keto group. Now, normally, ketones, as we've already covered, are not easily oxidized. Hence, they don't reduce things. Aldehydes get oxidized easily, so that means they reduce things. So if we hit an aldehyde with Tollens reagent, we would see oxidation of the aldehyde, and you get silver metal. But because we have a ketone here, you would not expect fructose to do this type of reaction. What's interesting, though, in Tollens reagent, because you're present in base, the base can actually deprotonate one of the neighboring uh, alpha hydrogens. If it does so, it can produce an enol. And you can put, actually produce what is called, in this case, because there's two OHs off the double bond, an enediol intermediate. And so this is referred to as an enediol 
intermediate. Okay, so we have this in dial intermediate and we can now hit it with base once again and convert it back. Now it can go back to keto form, but this time the keto form can form, form at carbon 1. And if it does, you get an aldehyde. And if you get an aldehyde, you can get the OH at the other end of double bond forming in that direction. If it does, you get this molecule, which is D-glucose, or the OH the carbon 2 could have formed pointing the other way and if it did you would get the sugar called D-mannose but both sugars D-mannose and D-glucose are aldehydes and because of that both can react with the silver reagent producing your silver mirror reducing the silver and hence these two guys are reducing sugars Well, the de Bruyne van Exenstein transformation, or the equilibrium with the equilibrium with these aldehyde forms from the keto form, allows de fructose also by converting to de glucose and de mannose to convert silver and the Tollens reagent silver plus into silver metal. Because of that, defructose becomes a reducing sugar. You react it with Tollens reagent, it reacts. It reacts because the base converts it to D-glucose and D-mannose. But all of this chemistry was based on equilibrium through the ene diol intermediate. And so this tautomerization, if you like, is very important to biochemistry and uh, very important to rationalizing why defructose is a reducing sugar. So the acidity of the alpha carbon in carbonyls is important. I'm Dr. Brian Lloyd, this is my scribble cast. Thank you very much.